All right, welcome to another episode of Model Building Start to Finish. We're going to continue painting, I think, this time, right, Dan? Right. Okay. Well, I guess I should mention, this is John. I'm sitting here with Dan. And, you know, the, the saga continues with the SD40-2 build. Right. On the full-size engine, the yellow Santa Fe logo on the side is the same color as the yellow on the rest of the locomotive. To reproduce that as closely as possible, I want to match the yellow on the model to the yellow on the decal sheet. I'm using scale coat reefer yellow, which is close but not quite orange enough. To tint the paint, I'm adding one drop of scale coat Santa Fe red at a time. I mix the paint, then check it, and repeat until the color is close to the yellow on the decal sheet. It's important to proceed slowly, as red is a very strong color and it's not too hard to overdo it. I should probably mention that I'm not using a set formula. How many drops of red depends on how much yellow paint is in the bottle to begin with. In this case, it took three drops of red. I'm really just using my eye to tell me when the color is right. Once the paint is mixed, I add some Scale Coat 2 thinner, since this is Scale Coat 2 paint. I like to apply the paint in light coats and build up the color slowly. This produces a better finish than trying to spray the paint in one thick coat. So I brought the model back to the studio uh, now that the yellow's on it, so yeah. we could take a look at it. Someone's been busy. Yeah, so uh, through the magic of TV, this is actually like two days after I actually sprayed the color. Mm -hmm. And... One thing, um, since I use Scale Coat, Scale Coat will stay tacky for about a day. So it's very important to kind of put the model aside and not disturb it for at least 24 hours, preferably longer. Um, it still has a little bit of paint odor to it, so I'll probably let it cure for even longer before I actually start masking it to do the blue. Yeah, otherwise you might pull some of the yellow off, right? Yeah, it doesn't usually happen with Scale Coat, but um, yeah, I don't want I don't want anything like that to happen. Um, but it's looking good so far. Uh, the paint is relatively smooth. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's not, you, you know, it doesn't have that like real thick orange peel effect that you can get sometimes if the paint is not thinned enough when you airbrush it. And, um, it's on all the places that need to be yellow. Yeah. Good. And, and I, of course you can see that some parts are still mostly white cause this is going to be blue. So there's really no reason to paint that part yellow. Um, so I just concentrated the paint in the areas where I needed it. Yeah. I can see there's a very distinct gradient across sort of the, by the fans. Right. And also on the side by the fans too. So. Right. Because the cab will of course stay yellow, but then the war bonnet is going to come, you know, down like yeah. this. So it's, it's not going to go back much further than about here. Just so I understand right then. So you're done with the yellow and right. you're waiting for it to dry so that you can mask it and then do the blue. Right. So it's getting really close to being done, isn't it? Pretty close. The Once the blue is on, that'll pretty much be the major part of the paint job. And then it'll need a clear coat. And then you can put we can put decals on it. I always work from light to dark because yellow wouldn't cover dark blue at all. Uh -huh. Dark blue on the other hand will cover anything. Yeah. It's so, almost <laughs> as good as black, huh? Yeah. So um, it, it much easier to spray dark blue over yellow than it is to do it the other way. Okay. Well, I guess we'll watch you paint the blue next. Yeah. Well, we'll watch you mask it next, and then paint the blue. Right. Before we can paint the blue, um, obviously we're going to have to do a little bit of masking. And masking a war bonnet is a little more difficult than some paint schemes, but it's not really that hard. It's just a little tedious. Okay. Well, it's because you have curved lines, huh? Right. This is Microscale Sheet 87-475. And it includes a bunch of war bonnet patterns that you could use as decals if you wanted to. There's a couple problems with that, though. One is that on the fireman side of the engine especially, there's the blower bulge. And trying to get a decal to lay down over all that and all the vents and all the doors and everything on the hood. Sounds like a pain. Yeah. I don't think it would end up looking very good. You'd have to cut it a lot, and you'd end up with gaps and vo you know voids, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing is that it's really hard to match the paint color to the decal. Yeah. Very, very difficult. And last, um, looking at the photos, it doesn't look like, like this is supposed to be an SD40-2 here. And maybe it's right for some units, but looking at 5126, it doesn't look like this curve's exactly correct. Hmm. So I'm going to do my own and, and not use this. Oh, I just wanted to mention it though because you can sometimes use these as patterns. 
to okay. cut out masking if you want to. Right. But um, I'm going to do it a little di bit differently. What I figured out is that you can use a circle template, like one of these that has different sized circles. Yeah. To approximate the shape of the war bonnet. Oh, right, because it's a big, big curvy thing anyway. Right. So, and I've already figured out a template for um, SD forty dash twos, and it also works for GP fifty. That's I made notes for this. I've I've made my own uh, drawings for several of these for different types of locomotives. But what I figured out is the little tiny curve that goes in the battery box area. It's a semicircle, isn't it? Semicircle, and that's a nineteen sixty fourths uh, size circle. Uh huh. And then there's uh, this bottom of the larger curve which is tighter is a five eighths circle oh, and then i see where you're going with this this top part is about a two and a half or two and a quarter i think circle. we did a podcast about painting a kodachrome yeah where you showed I, something like this i talked about it but i i actually want to this time we'll actually do it so what i have here is a plate glass cutting surface with lines on it mm -hmm. and i've put a piece of blue painter's tape butted up against one of those lines. Uh-huh, so to, it's straight, right? Right, help keep it straight. And then I put the circle template also using one of the lines to help keep it straight and centering it on one of the other lines here. Oh, the horizontal lines? Yeah, actually, yeah. It's, it's this circle. I'm sorry, I was pointing the wrong place. Um, oh, I, I see what you're looking at. Yeah, it's the 1964. I know it's upside down. It looks like a 61, but that's that's 19. We're looking at this. Right. And you're talking about this this circle right here. This vertical line yeah, and this see, vertical line yeah. lines up to this. Right. Got it. Because these, these circles have convenient um, center marks yeah. on them. So, and then what I'm going to do is I've got this circle right up against the edge of the tape. Mm -hmm. And then I, this is a brand new blade. So it's very sharp. You want to use a new blade because you don't want the tape to tear. And, and just very carefully tracing around the edge. What if you had a hole punch? Wouldn't that be easier? I mean, it would have to be the right size. It would have to be exactly the right size. Yeah. And yeah, you could do it that way if you happen to have a punch that was exactly the right size. Um, I haven't found any punches that are exactly the right well, I'm size. Just saying, it's just another way it could happen, yeah, right? Yeah. Or maybe one of those modern uh, laser cutters that you can put material in and... Oh. Have it cut it for you. That would be really neat. That would be cool. Yeah. Because the way you're doing it right now, I could see myself just shaving the inside of that circle template. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm trying not to do that, although yeah. I can see a few little plastic bits um, coming up, so I probably did nick it a bit. If you have a metal one, it might be better, huh? Yeah, unfortunately, all I have is this plastic one. Okay, so if this worked, I should be able to pull this circle out of here now. Yeah, it's hard to even see it. Oh, look at that. Okay, so far so good. I'm going to put a straight edge right on that center line. Line it up very carefully. Oh, you're going to cut it in half there, huh? Right, I'm going to cut it right in half. And then just to make it a little easier to deal with, I'm going to cut it this way too. Okay, and just to make these pieces a little more manageable in size, I'm going to cut them again to either side. So is the distance from the circle to what you're cutting now critical? Or? Not really. Oh. No. Um, I'm just kind of arbitrarily going four units here, which is, I think, an inch. Looks like about an inch. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is divided into a quarter-inch squares. Okay. So now... We can take one of these pieces. Oh, I see what you did. You made both sides at the same time, didn't you? Exactly. Both masks. So I did this off camera to make sure I got it in exactly the right spot. You kind of have to, huh? Yeah. I'm trying to be really careful with placement as if I was putting decals on the model and careful with where they go. So the um, edge of the semicircle, or the semicircle really kind of starts right at the cab, uh -huh. and then it goes forward and then comes back. And you're using reference photos to determine this? Yes. 
Yes. So once the tape is on, and then I'm going to use my fingernail. See how there's this ridge on the bottom of the battery box? Yeah. want to make sure to burnish that down so that there's no paint bleed under it. Yeah, that would look really crappy if it if it gets under there and look R- fuzzy. Right. And you just don't use a screwdriver or anything that might mar the paint. I, that's why I like to use my fingernail because it's pretty safe. It's not going to hurt the paint on the model. So while Dan's working on the other side, I'm going to mention this. This is one of those sort of uh, processes where we're going to have to do this to both sides. So we're going to show it in an, in its entirety on one side and just realize you're going to have to do this again on your other side. But the important thing to remember here is to make the placement of this stuff very carefully and triple check it with your reference material and then don't forget to to really push down on the tape with your fingernails to make sure you have a good seal between the the tape and the paint. Right. And I'll also add, make sure to use something like blue painter's tape because it has a relatively low tack. Oh, right. (laughs) You don't want to use really, really strong masking tape because it can pull the yellow off. Yeah, no duct tape. Yeah, and then nothing worse than having done this and then when you unmask the model, you end up ruining it because the tape pulled the other paint off. So one other thing I'll mention is, as you can see, this is not all of the area that we want to maintain as yellow. Uh (laughs) Um, What I'm going to do is do the most critical parts first and then fill in the blanks with other pieces of just regular tape. Right. I mean, because you you don't have to be, there's always going to be filler pieces is what I'm saying. Yeah. But you're still going to use blue painter's tape, right? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought. I'm going to do almost the same thing again with the five eighths circle. Okay. And this is all from your notes, right? Right. I'm just copying um, or using the dimensions, I should say, um, that I have written down on my notes. Right. So I have kind of a stupid question. Uh, when you made those notes, what what were you working off of? Was it just observing it and measuring or... Did you um, see that somewhere? I Did think you... I actually started, remember the decal sheet we looked at a little while ago? Oh, did you test on that to figure out where everything was? I think was? I used, yeah, I used one of them, not necessarily the one that said SD40-2, but one of the other ones. Mm-hmm. And that kind of got me going until I figured out about how big it should be. Yeah, I think I get it. Okay, so cut out the circle. Now, in this case, we want to save the circle, not the outside. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now that I've cut the circle, I'm going to cut this in half, just like I did with the other piece. And is the idea that you're going to make one for each side at the same time like you did on the other side? Right. So if I did this right, I should be able to peel off the excess tape. Oh, yeah, look at that. And we should have a nice circle. Okay, so before I peel these half circles off and use them, I'm going to cut a strip of tape. Uh Uh-huh. The size doesn't really matter. It just has to be straight. Well, I know you're going to answer this question, but why are you waiting to to take the other half circles off? Because, remember, this is a war bonnet shape. Uh-huh. And you know the, the circle on the battery box? Yeah. Well, the war bonnet line goes around that circle and then goes perfectly straight down the model oh. to this circle. And if you just have this circle on the model and the other circle on the model, it's really hard to figure out how to line them up. I see. Uh, without putting them on and taking them off 15 times. So I see. I'm going to use this little piece of tape to try to determine the alignment a little more easily. I'm also just going to square off the ends of the tape so I don't have that rough torn piece on there. And I'll cut it somewhere so I have a couple pieces rather than just one. I should mention, too, that before using the glass, it's good to clean it. Make sure that it's really clean without any dust on it. (laughs) With either some glass cleaner or alcohol or something, you know. Yeah, it's funny. You say that, and it seems like common sense, but I could see just wanting to get started and you forget. And then suddenly you have little blobs of crap under the tape. Right. You don't don't want foreign stuff under the tape. So... If That's you have important. if you have a clean room, it's good to work in the clean room too, right? <laughs> yeah, that would be even better. After many minutes of 
tedious <laughs> pressing and fitting and test fitting and refitting. Yeah. I've used that little strip on the bottom to kind of make sure that it's going straight. Yep. You've connected the, the two, right? Right. And then I positioned the lower semicircle, this tighter curve, um, according to reference photos. Uh huh. So this is pretty close to what's on uh, the real engine, if not exactly. I still have to build the rest of the curve up here. Mm -hmm. But we got this bottom part. Which is important. Right. Another thing, too, I'd mention, like, this little thing I'm using as a pointer is actually a KD uncoupling tool, which is a piece of plastic, basically. Yeah. Um, this is a good burnisher for getting the tape down into uh, mm -hmm. crevices. If in places, you know, like in here. In the you, corner, huh? Yeah, where you can't really get your fingernail too easily unless you've got really long fingernails. Probably um, most people doing this don't have the longest fingernails. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So I got another piece of tape, and now I'm going to cut the two and a quarter inch circle. And I don't need a full circle for this, just a, an arc. And this is that part that goes kind of behind the cab, is that it? Or, or across the grills? Yeah. No, you cut it, cut it in half, right? Yeah, just like before. And now I should be able to take it. That's not what that one yet. Take this piece yeah. out. It's nice and clean. Yeah. Now I may need to trim this down in case it doesn't fit over things. Um, mm -hmm. Like if, you know, there's something in the way down here. But in any case, I'm going to use this to complete the curve. I did end up having to cut this a little bit mm -hmm. right around the edge of the cab just because it, it fits better this way. Mm -hmm. But this upper curve is the two and a quarter inch part. And then I made it blend into the sharper curve down here. Mm -hmm. And then it's really just a matter now of using little bits of tape to fill in holes like this. Yeah. And also the when I was pushing the tape down underneath this grill, it tore a little, so I'll have to put a little piece there. Yeah. And, of course, the entire cab is going to get masked, too. But we'll get to that in a little bit. I wonder when they developed that paint scheme, if they did it using various sizes of arcs or if someone just came up with some swoopy-looking thing. I, it wouldn't surprise me if they actually... I mean, I think originally Santa Fe used parabolas. But a parabola is kind of a funky thing to to actually translate into real material unless you've got some really precise way to lay it out. Yeah. So um, it wouldn't surprise me if they used circles. It would be interesting to find out somehow. Yeah. I have no idea how you'd find out. But but anyway. this, this shape that I have on here pretty closely approximates what's on the real engine. Yeah. Oh, no, I can tell. You can see yeah. it. With the picture, you can see it. Yeah. So now I'm going to cut a piece of tape approximately five HO scale feet wide. And does that go down the side or something or the top of it? Um, or this what? is, this is going to start to wrap the cab. All right. So I'm cutting a length of approximately 28 HO scale feet. This may not be exactly right, but it'll be, get us started. It'll be close. Yeah. So as you can see, I've filled in using some scrap pieces of tape, mm -hmm. the little gaps here. And I'm going to start with this. Like about there. We'll just wrap it around the front. Oh, and we're going to actually get to see the other side that you've taped off also. Right. Well, we, me as in the viewers and I, will see. See right. that? The important part about this is to make sure you have a nice tight seal right here. Because mm -hmm. this right here is going to be blue. <laughs> Do you know what they did was somebody back in 1972 was thinking... I'm going to make the hardest possible paint job for someone to model in in 40 years. <laughs> yeah, right. The line across the top is pretty much just straight. <laughs> the one easy part of the whole paint job. Yeah, so I cut a thin strip of tape, and I'm going to put it behind these antenna stands, right flush with the edge of the cab. So now I can just use little bits of tape to kind of wrap the entire cab. <laughs> and... The main thing here is just to make sure that there's no way any overspray can get in here. Yeah. That would look really bad. Right. So you just keep layering on tape until you've got the entire thing covered, basically. Another thing I like to do is to take some tissue paper or a paper towel, uh -huh. stuff it inside the cab, yeah. just to prevent any overspray from coming up through the windows. Oh. 
you know, not that I'm going to be shooting the engine this way. Yeah, but, but it's good to prevent it anyway. Right, because you just never know. Overspray can get you from, you know, unexpected places sometimes. So the yeah. more holes you plug up, the better. So now it's time to move on to the sill. And I've cut a piece of tape that's as long as the entire sill from here to here. Okay. From the one step well to the other. And it's uh, three quarters of a scale foot wide. And I'm just going to run it right down here to create the yellow stripe. Yeah, this kind of stuff would drive me crazy, trying to get all this perfect like that. It's good though, huh? Yeah, so what I'm doing is uh, the jacking pads need to be exposed because those are going to be blue. Right. Um, some of this other stuff I may mask off because uh, the air reservoirs should be black and the other details on the bottom should be black, so we won't paint those yet. But I also want to make sure that I can paint the top of the walkway tread blue, so I don't want to mask it too high. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, has to be blue right here. Right. I still have to mask this area. So, But, but really all you're doing, though, is very carefully covering this thing in tape in the places where it needs to be covered. Right. Anything you want to stay yellow, basically. I measured a piece of tape that's basically runs from here to here, mm -hmm. and I'm going to use it to wrap the bottom of the sill just a little so there's no possibility of getting like a little thin blue line along the bottom. Oh, yeah. That would suck. just kind of wrap it around like that also you might have noticed that i've already masked the uh front of the anti-climber mm -hmm. uh with that same width of tape the three quarters of a foot yeah so um just to continue the stripe around the front yeah as we progress here you know we're not showing every single strip of tape that gets put on this thing so yeah it would get really tedious yeah i th i think the important thing for people to remember is that you're using reference photos to understand where the tape needs to go. Right. And then just being very careful to put it on and to make sure it's sealed properly. Right. The battery boxes are a little tricky because the top has to be blue, but the rest of it needs to stay yellow. What I'm doing is I'm using little strips of tape rather than one big piece. And the reason for that is because you've got a grab iron on this side and there's a step on this side that actually needs to stay blue. As you can see, I've already masked this yeah. and I've masked around the step, but it's easier if you cut small strips uh -huh. than trying to do it all at once and somehow fit the tape around this. Yeah. So that's the same thing I'm doing here. Um, because the grab iron is kind of in the way, uh, I'm afraid I won't get a good edge seal if I tried to have something bulging over that, you know? <laughs> so I'm just using thin strips to kind of make sure I get a good edge and then I'll fill in. Once again, I've used thin strips of tape to start the masking on the back of the engine. Uh -huh. And I've used kind of siding, the method of siding down the, the tape to make sure it's straight. Yeah. Um, kind of like, you know, you look at it this way. As sharp of an angle as possible. Right. Um, or actually, that would, that's not a sharp angle, is it? A shallow angle, I guess. Yeah, it's a shallow angle. But um, once you get that line and get the tape burnished down, then it's just a matter of filling in the rest of it. Yeah, you're having to fill the hole back, aren't you? Of course, yeah. yeah. Um, otherwise, i just end up with a yellow stripe going around the end of the engine, which <laughs> isn't really, what I want. That would look really nice. Yeah. I've also used some thin strips of tape to mask the sides of the drop step thing. Yeah. because I noticed on the photographs that it is um, yellow there. And another thing I wanted to point out, um, I did actually find a roof shot of this engine finally. Uh, it's a distant shot, but it's good enough to show that the yellow line goes straight across okay. on the top. Whereas um, on some Santa Fe engines, it kind of followed the profile of the uh, point. The V shape. Yeah. yeah. So it really pays off to... Uh, pay attention to prototype photos when possible. Um, also, even just for the placement of the war bonnet on the side, sometimes on different engines, it's in a slightly different place. So yeah. uh, really good to have photos of the engine that you're working on. More progress. Yeah. So I've filled in the, the back and I've also put some broader pieces of tape uh, over where the air reservoirs are yep. just to kind of keep overspray off of all that stuff down there. So this is almost there. So I cut a few more strips of three-quarter foot wide 
tape, the microscale decal sheet instructions say this should be six inches, but this step is higher than that on the model. Yeah. So um, I basically use the model as a pattern. But anyway, uh, I guess Santa Fe left this area yellow uh, for safety. So you could see the step probably. No, no, they did it. So it would be hard to paint later. Well, that too. Yeah. (laughs) So I've masked the top of the short hood with some more strips of tape. And the reason I'm holding a flashlight up here is what I do is I kind of look at it slightly backlit and I try to make that dark part around the edge the same width the whole way around. Oh, yeah, because you don't want that little stripey thing to be like angled, huh? Right. You don't want it to be off to one side or or crooked or, you know, anything like that. So um, if you hold it up and backlight it slightly, you can hold it up to a window or or a light Uh um, and just look at the dark strip around the edge where the tape is on the part instead of just being hanging over the air, you know, Um, then you can see the width of it and you just try to make it the same on all sides. So the last thing is just to fill in and make sure that there's no possibility that overspray is going to get anywhere else, you know, on the rest of it. It's supposed to stay yellow. Right. So is this it? That's that's all filled in? or That's pretty much it. So this uh, thing's pretty much ready for the blue now. Okay. Time to go to the booth. Yep. So as I was masking the engine, at the last minute, I noticed that the nose door on 5126 had been replaced, and the replacement door had blue on the bottom. Uh, it looked like it must have come from another locomotive. So I masked my door to match that. Another last minute thing I'm doing is to mask the step edges with tape. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is that they're already yellow, and I thought it might save some time later. Now the very top one that's flush with the deck is really hard to do, so I think I'll get that one with a decal. And sometimes I use decals for the other steps too, but in this case I thought I'd just try the tape. I'll start spraying the blue on the nose. It's very important to build up paint in thin coats, especially on pieces that are masked like this one. That minimizes the chances that paint will creep under the tape. With small parts, it's important to hit them from multiple angles to make sure they're covered completely. Spraying the body of the engine, I'm again spraying thin coats. And I'm also trying to keep the stream of spray perpendicular to the surface when possible. That minimizes the chances that any overspray will creep under the tape in case there's any spots where the tape isn't completely sealed. So now that I've given all the pieces an initial coat of blue, I'm going through and giving them a second coat. This will probably be all it needs because this is a pretty dark color and it covers well. It's important to spray the shell of the engine from multiple angles as well in order to make sure that the paint coverage is complete. And this is especially true in areas like under the dynamic brakes where there's an overhang. I like to remove the masking from the engine as soon as possible after I'm done spraying. So I've taken all the tape off the engine and I'm pretty happy with what I'm seeing so far. It looks pretty good and uh, so far so good. So I've used some tape and paper towels to mask almost the entire engine and what I'm going to do next is to spray paint the air reservoirs black. I'm using Tester's Model Master acrylic black paint for the air reservoirs. I thin this paint with Windex. Now I'm painting the air reservoirs. And I'm mostly concerned about painting the tanks because they're big. The other little detail parts like the bell and air filters and things, I can get with a brush later, so I'm not too worried about those. Now I've taken off the masking and it looks like the air reservoirs look pretty good. The final step in the process is to spray the model with a clear coat that's glossy to prepare it for decals. Now the scale coat paint dries with a glossy surface, so you could probably skip this, but I still prefer to use the micro gloss on my model. And I thin the micro gloss with Windex, just like the acrylic paint. When I spray on the clear coat, it isn't necessary to put on too much, just enough to cover all the areas that are gonna have decals put on them. So you can kind of go lighter on the roof and places like that. It's mostly on the sides where that big Santa Fe decal is going to go and the cab where the numbers are going to go. I also clear coat the nose because of the Santa Fe cigar band decal that goes on that piece. Okay, so now the uh, airbrushing and clear coating is done. Nice. It looks really good. Yeah, thanks. I'm I'm pretty happy with it so far. It looks more finished than it ever has. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's really starting to look like uh, something now. 
Um, anyway, uh, all that's left painting wise is to use a brush to get some of those little details on the bottom that need to be black. And, okay. And one needs to be silver. So okay. Do that next. So this is the same Model Master flat black that I was spraying on the tanks. Okay. So you're able to do this with a brush just because it's going to be kind of out of sight. Is that kind of the deal? Well, and it's yeah. small. Basically, because it's small. Um, I don't like using brushes for large parts because um, sometimes it shows brush strokes. Yeah, it would look terrible. Yeah, but on a little tiny part, you really can't see that. Yeah, plus it's underneath, right? I mean, you're not even really going to see this much anyway, whatever you're doing. Right. The last part is this air filter, and I'm going to get that with some True Color Paint Silver. Oh, right. You did say something was going to be silver down there. Hey, it's all done. Well, <laughs> no, <laughs> but it's starting to look like a, a like, locomotive now. Yeah, like a real something that would have been out there, huh? Yeah. So I think this is probably a good place to stop the chapter since we're done with the painting phase. All right. And uh, next time we'll pick it up and start doing the decals. Okay. I guess we'll see everybody next time.